actually the esplanade, and you can see the topo kind of lines in here. By the time he got to surprise, it was dark. They had a, he had no map, but he had a GPS. But what he did not do with his GPS is put in the coordinates for this location. So he was in this area in the dark. He could not consult the GPS and get that little arrow that is extremely helpful if you're wandering around in the dark. And if for those of you who have walked this trail, you realize that um, it goes uphill and it starts to go seemingly the wrong direction if you're not familiar with it. What happened here is reconstructed, he got lost back and forth, back and forth, trying to second guess where this was the correct trail. It looked like it went the wrong direction. And probably about 400 yards from the, where the falls in the previous slide was visible, he lost, he panicked. He dropped his gear, dropped his whole backpack, and, uh, come on, where are you? I think we ran out of steam. Ran out of laser here. Underneath the Y on the trail on the dotted line, he dropped off his pack, then he reversed back to where it says Deer Creek TR. And uh, in that area, there's a wash that follows down the trail. It's not actually the trail. The trail crosses and enters and then exits the wash. And he followed that. There we go. Right in here. It took the searchers about a week, and there are all, all, all together over 100 people on the search. Um, he vanished altogether, and after after almost a week, they found a plastic garbage bag with food and so on at this location. And so then they started their search this way from both directions. The dog team in here, and people hiking up from the bottom, and actually doing technical climbing. It's not possible to hike up from the bottom. This is where uh, he was only 400 yards from being able to see and hear this when he changed his mind, reverse direction, dropped his pack, probably with, and at that point with no water whatsoever. And uh, he continued down that, did I just jump to? Yeah, continued down this wash, this is looking south toward the Colorado River, and that's Bonita Canyon right there. So it looks, it looks really inviting in this neighborhood. And then it gets progressively more ridiculous because it has to drop a couple thousand feet in just about a mile. Amazingly, it appears that Bryce down climbed this in the dark. That's not him. This is a, these are other people canyoning. But this particular 40, 50, 40 to 50 foot, he climbed down and probably made a jump out of a crack in here and was therefore committed and could not return. What happened next, and very shortly thereafter, was he hit this 100-foot drop-off. So it, we could focus on a lot of details of this, but one of the most, the greatest ironies is he definitely carried, uh, again, I know I'm repeating myself, the minimal amount of water. And when he was lost, had he had water, he could have been back right on the trail, waited till dawn, and then looked around. It probably would have been a five, six-hour wait. Could have gotten his bearings, and, and we wouldn't be talking about it right there right now, but he just uh, created for himself the worst nightmare that a, a canyon hiker can ever create. Those of you who read uh, Ed Abbey's uh, little section on Havasu, this was what happened to Bryce for real and he didn't get out of it. He did have time to sit there for another 12 hours or more and basically dehydrate. He clawed his way into Tried to claw his way here handed into cactus. This is, this is another view of the drop that he couldn't do. He was found at this location. He um, pruned up. Anyway, he had time to leave a message on his Blackberry. He left a couple of messages on it. One of them was, I don't know what happens in the afterlife, but I hope there's water. <laughs> okay, so this is the breakdown currently as of right now in the last two weeks of heat. This is 95 total deaths that are heat related, uh, environmental related, excuse me, some of them are, were cold. And um, mm. nearly 90% this is the victim down here, third from the bottom, nearly 90% of these victims are males, which tells a lot. And, and this is not a diminishing tendency. You can see three deaths of young men in the summer of 2009. And what about women? Are, women are not immune 
into this problem, and they have their own special ways of manifesting it, but it's definitely a male thing. And it usually revolves around really bad planning. So the next story is about Harvard Bradley. This is a really tough story to write. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about Margaret. Um, she was a medical student from the University of Chicago. She's very bright, and she was a great runner. She, in college, she was an All-American uh, Division III champion. She finished 31st at the Boston Marathon in 2003. She was interviewed by a magazine afterward and asked her what she attributed her success to, and she said it was to uh, her uh, understanding of, of the importance of staying hydrated. Unfortunately, she was lured into Grand Canyon by a guy. Uh, a lot of women who die in Grand Canyon are often with men who lure them into things that they probably wouldn't have done otherwise. She uh, was with a friend, an acquaintance named Ryan, and they had run around here in Flystaff. He was familiar with Grand Canyon, he'd hiked a little bit, and they had done some running in Schultz Pass, but then decided to do a running Grand Canyon because Margaret had been there. The problem is this July, screaming hot, a tough time to run. And, the plan was to go down the Grandview Trail along the Tonto to the South Kaibab Trail. So those of you who know that area, that's a long way. Um, this is kind of what it would entail. You would start like way over there, you're running way over there, you're way over there, way back over there, and you come over here, and you're, right, and you're all exposed, and this goes on and on and on. Ryan told Margaret that the route was 15 miles. Unfortunately, he didn't want to do his homework. It's more like 30, so it was double that. It was over a marathon. And she brought her usual running water amount for that hike, or that particular run. She brought a little less than two liters. And she was used to running 50 miles in two liters. She would tank up after the race. He brought about three. So the problem was, again, they didn't have a map. They didn't do their homework, and it was 30 miles. And it turned out to be she was the run of her life, for her life. They went down Grandview here, Horseshoe Mesa, down around the Tonto. We get over here. They pass Grapevine, and I don't know how many of you hike the Tonto to run Grapevine. That's a gigantic, huge slog. My daughter and I did that, and my nephew. Uh, slog of a canyon, you go five miles to net one. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. But there's great water in Grapevine. I mean, it's spectacular. They didn't know it. They were out of water by that point. They're not very far to the hike. And if they'd gone uh, 50, 100 yards either way, up, up canyon or down canyon, they'd found water. So they keep going, they get to here, Boulder Creek area, what's dry. Most creeks that are named that in Grand Canyon are usually dry. And they slid up. Ryan is in the throes of heat stroke. He hungers on a rock, and Margaret, who's the runner, decides to go for help. It's 15 miles. They're almost at the 15-mile point right there. She said, well, the Kaibab has to be close. She just keeps going, and unfortunately, she's got to go all the way over here, over the Kaibab, and then out. So she's going, and she passes you know, all these side canes, and she gets to cremation canyon, and she veers off. The 15 miles had come and went, and she knew it. She knew where she was, she's, she's may have thought she missed the trail, but Margaret is now herself dying of, of heat, and she's desperate. So she gets to cremation drainage, this is all looking at the cremation from the Kaibab, and she goes down here, she needs to get the water, water goes downhill. Here's the trail, but she veered down there. Margaret goes, it's a beautiful canyon. If you, hike, if you get a chance to hike, you go down here, you get this little pour over, and she climbed down this thing, kind of like Bryce Gillies. It's about 15 feet. She shimmed down it, but she's really, really hurting. She's already in severe dehydration, very, very weak, and she makes it down that. Meanwhile, Ryan, who hunkered down, he gets up in the morning, and he staggers, makes it over to the tip off area of the Kaibab Trail. He runs into a U.S. Geologic Survey worker who's got a satellite phone. He says, can you do your favor? And then the, he speaks with her, and she, she calls the Phantom Ranch Ranger. Says, there's, yeah, there's hidden water, there's a cache, you know, near this um, it's an emergency phone. So they get the water and stuff, and he tanks up, cools off, and says, oh, by the way, can you tell that Phantom Ranger that my friend Margaret Bradley is going to move her car? He doesn't tell her, or the, there's no message given to the Ranger that Margaret might be in trouble. He just figured, Margaret, who could run any of us probably with the dirt, made it. So when they start hiking out, they run into another hiker, a trail guide, that Ryan knows, and he says, hey, give me a favor, get this message to Margaret Bradley, Phantom Ranch, that I'm going to move her car. Doesn't mention anything about Margaret maybe, maybe being in trouble. Further out, they run into a um, Park Service trail crew worker, 